All children deserve to be in a home where they will be loved, cared for, and have all of their basic needs met. They deserve to live in a clean, safe environment where they will be free from harm and protected from any dangers that come their way. But tragically, not every child is afforded that right. Some children are born to parents who not only don't care about them, but who want to see them suffer. Parents who will go out of their way to make sure that their children are in pain and torment. It's so tragic, but what's even worse is when these parents are investigated, the red flags are waving in the faces of DCFS workers, yet nothing is done. That is what happened in this case. Five-year-old little Kinsley Welty was born into a dirty, disgusting home with parents who neglected her. And even when workers with the Department of Child and Family Services saw the horrific living conditions, nothing was done. Kinsley's mother was allowed to continue her abuse and neglect until her little body just couldn't take it anymore. This is the story of Kinsley Welty. Kinsley was born on December 30th, 2018 to parents Tony McClure and Bradley Welty in Mooresville, Indiana. She also had five siblings, Jordan, Jaden, Jordeen, Bradley, and Philly. Those who knew little Kinsley described that she was loving, caring, and sweet towards everyone in her life. She went out of her way to make sure that everyone around her was happy and she just wanted to make others laugh. She loved causing little bits of mischief, taking her dad's hat off as a little joke. She also loved singing You Need to Calm Down by Taylor Swift with her grandparents. Her favorite shows were Paw Patrol and Bubble Guppies, and she loved playing dress up and getting her hair done. She was your typical girly, sweet, five-year-old little baby. However, Kinsley's life was incredibly rough from the moment she was born. When Kinsley was first born, she lived with her mother and father, but according to family members, from the literal day Kinsley was born, her mother abused and neglected her. When she was three weeks old, family members reported that Kinsley appeared to be malnourished. She straight up wasn't being fed. When officers followed up on the report, they said that the state of the home in which baby Kinsley and her siblings were living were some of the worst conditions they had ever seen. Officers said that it appeared that the trash had never been taken out. There were flies and gnats flying all around the kitchen and the living room. In the bathroom, there were feces all over the toilet that hadn't been cleaned. The couch and the mattresses were covered in dirt. Kinsley's toddler age sibling and a one-year-old baby were running and crawling around on floors that were covered in garbage, dirt, and cigarette butts. There were full ashtrays, moldy food, and sharp objects all within the reach of the children. Rooms within that home were described as, quote, hazardous nightmares for an adult, let alone a toddler and a newborn. At the time, it was clear that little Kinsley was extremely malnourished and dirty. She was covered in dirt and filth and had a dry mouth and pale lips and was determined to be in a failure-to-thrive state losing weight despite being a tiny baby whose only job is to eat and grow. At the time, both Tori McClure and Bradley Welty were arrested. Tony was charged with four counts of child neglect, while Bradley was charged with two counts. For this, Tony would eventually plead guilty and was sentenced to 900 days in jail. However, for some unknown reason, her sentence was suspended after just six weeks. She was then given 540 days of probation. During that time of Tony being in jail, Kinsley and her siblings were obviously removed from the home. I'm not sure what happened with all of the siblings, but Kinsley was placed into the care of DCFS and eventually was set to stay with family members. Ultimately, she lived with her paternal grandmother, Bradley's mother, Trisha Welty, after this first arrest. But after Tony was released from her 21 days in jail, DCFS ordered for Kinsley to return back to her care. I haven't been able to find any information on why or how this decision was made. If you know more about that, please let me know. After being returned to Tony's care, as you can imagine, Kinsley's life only continued to get worse and worse. 
Some articles say that DCFS continued to get reports about Kinsley and how she was being treated, and they tried following up on the reports numerous times, but I guess they just couldn't get a hold of Tony and weren't able to locate Kinsley, so not a whole lot was done. Now, it's not exactly clear when this happened, but there was a time in which Kinsley was removed from the home again and placed into the care of her grandmother. According to Trisha, when they got Kinsley the second time, she was covered in bruises from head to toe. She had chunks of hair missing all throughout her head. She was filthy, and the living conditions within the home were just as bad as they always had been. I want to note that at this time, Bradley, Kinsley's father, was no longer living in the home with Tony and Kinsley. After this second time being removed from the home, however, it was reported that the case wasn't properly investigated by DCFS, so by the time it was brought in front of the courts, they didn't have the proper evidence to keep Kinsley out of the care of Tony. So, because of this, the case was dismissed and Kinsley was sent back to live with her mother. For the years that followed, once again, DCFS continued to get calls regarding the horrific conditions that Kinsley had to live through. According to Trisha, in 2021, they called DCFS with multiple concerns for her safety, saying that they were afraid that Kinsley was going to die. She pleaded with DCFS, but all of her concerns were flat out ignored. They were much more worried about the reunification process and making Kinsley live with her mother than actually investigating how she was being treated and then making a decision based on what was best for the child and not the parent. Then in April of 2024, for some unknown reason, Tony had another child. At this time, the newborn tested positive for THC, meaning that Tony had been smoking weed while pregnant. After this was discovered, a caseworker did pay Tony a visit at her home. They weren't able to locate Kinsley during this visit, but Tony said that Kinsley was at her grandparents' house at the time. So, once again, DCFS workers didn't follow up with anything, and they just ignored the fact that they were never able to see Kinsley during these visits, not bothering to do anything about it or looking further into it. The children were not removed from the home, despite the numerous other DCFS reports, workers seeing the disgusting and unlivable conditions of the home, and now it being clear that Tony was doing drugs while pregnant. Everything in this case, would come to a head on April 9th, 2024. Just before 5.15 p.m. that day, the Indianapolis Police Department were called to report an unresponsive child within the home where Tony McClure and her children lived. When officers arrived, they found five-year-old little Kinsley unresponsive in the home. Officers actually located Kinsley within a tiny closet. The closet was covered in feces with handprints in those feces. There was a dresser placed in front of that closet, obviously as a way to prevent Kinsley from leaving the closet. Upon inspecting little Kinsley, officers could immediately tell that she was extremely malnourished, her eyes were sunken in, and her skin and lips were pale and dry, and she was covered in bite marks. She was dirty, she had fecal matter all over her head, hands, and feet. She also had lice in her hair, which was extremely matted and unkept. First responders took little Kinsley to Riley's Children's Hospital in an attempt to save her life. However, their efforts were not enough. Five-year-old Kinsley Welty died in that hospital. According to later autopsy, it was found that Kinsley died of starvation. At the time, it was found that Kinsley weighed just 21 pounds, literally half of what she was supposed to weigh at her age. Her weight put her in the 0th percentile, far, far below what she should have been. It was clear that she had been starved for a prolonged period of time, leading to her death. Of course, after seeing little Kinsley in that closet, the conditions she was forced to suffer, and her dying in that hospital, 
29-year-old Tony McClure was arrested and taken into the station for questioning. When she first started talking to the police, she told them that Bradley, Kinsley's father, was actually the one responsible for abusing and neglecting Kinsley. However, that story quickly fell apart because Bradley didn't even live in the home. At the time, Tony actually had a boyfriend, 27-year-old Ryan Smith, who I will talk more about in just a minute. But after some pushing, Tony ultimately cracked and told investigators some of the horrific, brutal things that little Kinsley went through throughout her life and especially in the months leading to her death. Starting on Thanksgiving in 2023, Kinsley spent most of her time locked inside a tiny closet, which was barricaded by a dresser to prevent Kinsley from getting out. Tony said that she hardly ever fed Kinsley, even though Kinsley was constantly complaining of being hungry and begging for food. She wasn't allowed to eat. Tony went on to explain that she was worried that doing this would ultimately lead to her death, but she didn't care enough to do anything about it. She really just wanted Kinsley out of her life. She didn't want to deal with her. At the same time that investigators were speaking with Tony, they were also questioning her live-in boyfriend, Ryan. He said that he knew Kinsley was being kept in that closet and he knew she was losing weight. He also was worried about what would happen, but he loved Tony too much to do anything about it, such as letting her out or even reporting the abuse to police. Ryan then told investigators that he believed that Kinsley had been let out of that closet 10 times since Thanksgiving. That means that for days, if not weeks at a time, she was forced to stay in that closet. She had to go to the bathroom on herself. She had to sleep in her own urine and feces. She wasn't allowed to eat or drink. She was just stuck in that tiny closet for days and days and days. That is five months or about 22 weeks that she was kept in that closet, only being let out 10 times. That is less than every two weeks, and that is even if we believe Ryan. He could have been rounding up or guessing, so who knows how often she was actually let out. Tony clearly did not want her daughter in her life. She clearly wanted her dead, and she wanted her to no longer be her problem. That's obvious. But she had ample opportunity to get Kinsley out of the home if that's what she wanted, there were two times where Kinsley was taken and lived with family who actually wanted her, yet she always took her back. So to me, it's not just that Tony didn't want Kinsley. She didn't just want her out of her life. She wanted to make sure that Kinsley suffered as much as possible. She wanted her daughter to starve to death. In the weeks after this tragic, horrific death, police continued their investigation to see how this could have happened and if anyone else was involved. And as if Kinsley's treatment by her own mother wasn't bad enough, turns out there was more. Police ended up questioning Tony's mother or Kinsley's grandmother, 53-year-old Tammy Halsey. In an interview with police, she admitted that she knew Kinsley was being kept in the closet. She knew for months that Tony wasn't treating her right because she watched as Kinsley's condition grew worse and worse over the course of five to six months, but she didn't do anything about it. In fact, she helped Tony get away with it. Like I mentioned earlier, there were several times in which DCFS tried getting a hold of Tony but weren't able to. There were numerous reports about how badly she treated Kinsley, but DCFS never did anything because Tony was making it difficult for them. Well, Tammy actually knew about this and knew where Tony was and where Kinsley was, but wouldn't tell DCFS. Instead, she told Tony that DCFS was looking into her and wanted to give her time to get everything together to show that she was competent. As she watched Kinsley get more and more malnourished and sickly, she thought about calling police, but she never did. She didn't want to put Tony at risk of losing her children, which I know all of these children lived in horrific, disgusting conditions, 
but that statement makes me believe that it was just Kinsley who is being abused and neglected to this extent. Not only did Tammy not report the abuse, but she participated in it. According to Tammy, she would watch Kinsley a lot during the summer of 2023, and Kinsley would occasionally spend a night or two at her home after that. However, these nights at grandma's would not serve as a break for Kinsley. When at Tammy's, she would duct tape Kinsley to the bed. At first, she would duct tape her arms and legs to the covers, but when that didn't work, she put more and more tape over her shoulders, upper legs, upper arms, until basically her entire body was covered in duct tape. This was an effort to prevent Kinsley from getting out of bed and eating or drinking anything. The duct tape didn't always work though. A starving little Kinsley would rape the duct tape to get out of bed, so eventually, Tammy started tying her down to the bed. Again, she was preventing Kinsley from getting up to get something to eat. She was fully participating in the starvation torture of this five-year-old little girl. Again, this just shows that not only did Tony want Kinsley out of her life, but she actively wanted her to be tortured because even when she wasn't under Tony's watch, even when Tony got a break from her daughter, she was still being abused by Tammy and we don't exactly know why. We don't know if Tony asked Tammy to do this or if Tammy had done this to Tony and it was just one of those things where it just runs in the family, I guess, and because Tony was treated that way, she treated her kids that way. There's really no explanation for any of this, but after finding out this new information, 53-year-old Tammy Halsey was also arrested. As of right now, Tony McClure has been charged with murder, criminal confinement, and battery. Ryan is facing three counts of neglect leading to death, as well as criminal confinement. Tammy is being charged with neglect as well. I believe there are more charges in the works for Tammy. Police have hinted at that, but the investigation is still ongoing, so we don't know when or if those charges will be applied. What we are alleging here is that Grandma had prolonged periods of contact with this child, uh, was in a position to help this child. Five-year-old Kinsley Welty was laid to rest today. The Marion County Prosecutor's Office believes she died of starvation and dehydration after she was found unresponsive last week at a Southwest Side home in Indianapolis. Her mother, Tony McClure, grandmother and McClure's boyfriend are accused of playing a role in her death. Today, they appeared in court for the first time. Anything that you can say regarding this case? No There's a lot of conversation between both uh, mom and grandma about what was going on with this child and what was the best way to deal with some of these issues. And I think that's the part that's so disheartening is that nobody stepped in and said, this child needs help. What can we do to try to help this child? And the thing that you consistently see and hear uh, in these conversations is people are concerned about their own well-being. Well, I might get in trouble if someone is, is aware of this. Prosecutor Ryan Mears say they were in a position to help Kinsley, but didn't. Investigators say the little girl was locked in a closet while denied proper food and water. That suffering, the prosecutor's office says, led to her death. Investigators noted the closet also had feces on the door and clothing inside. Mears says more people could be held accountable. That investigation includes the Department of Child Services. DCS was at the house the day that this child passed away. Uh, and they were not uh, aware or when they made that house visit, they certainly uh, didn't uh, uncover or appreciate what was going on inside the house. And so I think that poses a lot of questions for us as a prosecutor's office in, in terms of what systems were in place. Did those systems necessarily uh, protect that child and then what can be done in the future? Of course, in the aftermath of this, family, friends, and the community are all absolutely outraged at how this could have happened. And their rage is absolutely understandable and I'm sure you all feel the same way. Somehow over the course of five years, DCFS received numerous reports and saw how dangerous and unsanitary the living conditions were, yet five children were still allowed to live in the home. Family members begged DCFS to do something, literally saying that Kinsley was going to die and she was still allowed to live with her mother in a home covered with trash, feces, 
insects, sharp objects, and moldy food. Kinsley's paternal grandparents are devastated at the loss of Kinsley, saying that they would have taken her in. In fact, they did twice. She was safe with them. She would have been fed, and she would have had a warm bed to sleep in. Yet, every time Kinsley was in their care, she was returned to their mother. If the parents aren't going to love and protect them, and the state's not, who's going to protect them? Flowers, balloons, and a card saying Forever Five, always in our hearts, baby Kinsley, sit outside the southwest side home she was found in. Metro police say the five-year-old was unresponsive, thin, with sunken eyes, and had feces on her feet and in her hair. Riley Hospital reports Kinsley was so malnourished, she weighed more at two and a half years old than at five. Traumatized, like terrific, but words can't describe the feelings. Yeah. They're guilty to eat sometimes. Grandparents Trisha and Brian Welty say the warning signs of Kinsley's health were reported, but say the Department of Child Services let them down. We just don't want her death to be in vain. We want change. We don't want any more kids to have to die because of the failure of the system. It's not right. She was in our home and she was safe and she was loved and she was handed back to her abuser and she's not here anymore. When she came to us the second time, she was bruised from head to toe. She had clumps of hair, of missing. hair missing throughout her whole head. And she was given back. And she had already tried to starve her to death when she was three weeks old. <laughs> and they gave her back. Following a welfare check in 2021, the grandparents say they were fearful Kinsley would die. I pleaded, pleaded with DCS before that court case. My concerns about all that, every bit of it, and I was ignored. According to police reports, the mother says just before Kinsley died, DCS was at the house but didn't see Kinsley. McClure says Kinsley frequently expressed that she wanted more food or that she was thirsty, but says she had a desire for her to be out of her life. Many people are calling for a change in the system, specifically with how reunification of families is handled. Right now, anytime a child in the system is taken away from their family, the main goal is reunification. That is the number one goal in any case. That is how so many of these children are just returned back to parents who have proven themselves time and time again to be abusive, neglectful monsters. The goal shouldn't be focused on the parents getting their child back. It should be on the child's safety. And if a parent has proven themselves to be neglectful or abusive, especially multiple times and show absolutely no signs of improving, and there is other family members willing to take the child, then why are these children still being forced to live with their abusers? That is something that I find wrong with our justice system as a whole. Many cases are focused on ensuring fairness for the defendant, the person accused of the crime. Sentencing is sometimes given leniency because of the struggles somebody faced. Yet, the person that is victimized, they don't get the same respect. The same thing is echoed in our child welfare system. The focus is on the parents being able to have their children, being able to improve their parenting not on the children being in the safest environment possible. We shouldn't be focused on the people who are hurting others. We need to be focused on the victims. And we need to make sure that DCFS workers are doing their jobs. We need to stop having all of these children slip through the cracks because nobody is checking in on them. Something needs to be done. More people need to be hired. More government resources needs to go into these programs instead of whatever else the government wants to spend their money on that makes absolutely no impact in the lives of the people who are paying the taxes. But as of right now, DCFS has not made any public comment. They're actually not allowed to until the case is resolved, though I don't expect any government entity to take any accountability for their actions because 
they never do. So why would they start now? It's 2024. Things like this have been happening for decades and still children with parents that are so clearly neglectful, who don't even try to hide it, who don't even try to hide the fact that they hate their children are just allowed to keep them. I'm so sick of children being victimized by disgusting monsters who never should have had children to begin with. I'm so sick of our child protection system doing everything except protecting children. I'm so sick of hearing, well, we couldn't get a hold of her for years, so I guess there's nothing we can do. That is literally empowering abusers to just make the lives of everyone around them harder because if they do it enough, they'll just continue getting away with it. I don't know what needs to be done to change the system, but something needs to be done because I am so sick of hearing child protection workers not doing their damn jobs. I really hope that Tony, Ryan, and Tammy all get the absolute max sentences possible. I hope that Tony spends the rest of her miserable life in jail and never sees the light of day again. I hope that sad excuse for a man spends as much time in jail as possible and same thing with that poor excuse for a grandmother. And I hope the other inmates know what they all did and I hope they fully pay for it. That's all I'll say about that. As of right now, that is all of the information that we know about this case. Tony's trial is scheduled for June of this year, so if any new information comes out, I will keep you all updated either by updating the description of this video or if there's a lot of new information, I'll make a new video with that new information. But that is where I'm going to end today's case. Obviously, you all know how I feel about this case, how infuriating it is, and how upsetting it is that this all keeps happening, but now I want to know what you all think. What do you think could have been done to prevent this? What do you think of DCFS returning her home every time? Do you agree with me that Tony went out of her way to torture her daughter? What do you think of Ryan and Tammy's involvement? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!